what kind of signal can I tell you to get you to switch to me? What? So what kind of signal can I give you that says mean switch to me? Because when I look up, I think you know when I'm looking at the camera, but you think I'm looking at the monitor sometimes, don't you? Which I am sometimes. If I just... Hi everybody, welcome back to Make the Grade. This is Wednesday and today, my, well my name is Caroline Richardson, which is, it is every day, but um, I'm coming to you today to help you out with your math. What I, what's going to happen is the number is going to come across the bottom of the screen and you can call me in and ask questions about any of your math homework that you're having or parents, if you're working with your student and you're not quite sure what to do, just give me a call and we'll go through the problem, okay? Until I get calls or while I'm getting calls, I'm going to focus today and next Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday on EOG and then EOC review. Those tests are, some of you have already had your EOG, uh, and I know I guess Southeast, you're already working on EOCs, and uh, we need to review them. We need to review the material and be ready to go, okay? So I'm going to get started. Oh, one other thing. Let me just pop the number up here just so you have it. It will be coming across the bottom of your screen, but the number is 217-2203. And just give me a call, and I'll get to a question. If you would like to see the materials that I'm working on, if you go to the Wake County website, which is, let me push this up a little bit. Oops, that's not thick enough. Hold on. If you go to www.wcpss.net, that's where you're going to find the materials I'm using, the EOC uh, review problems. Do a search for Make the Grade, and you'll find the EOC review problems. Now, if you can't be near your TV, you can go to http colon slash slash ewtv.org for eastwaketelevision.org. And if you don't see me on the air, then you can go to this website and look at us live streaming on the web. And you can still call and ask your questions. And then throughout the rest of the week, if you want to email me, I will check the website for any other questions you have. Remember, we're going to be focusing in... We're going to be focusing in on the EOCs and EOGs, practice problems. I'm going to try to talk a little bit about strategies. I'm going to try to calm you and give you some ideas on things that you can do. Every single one of you can do excellent on this test, on these tests. I know you can. Okay, you've worked really hard with your teachers. You're ready for them. Thing is, is you have to go in calm and relax. And if you've practiced, and math is really a lot of practice. I mean, think about it. There's an infinite number of numbers out there, which means there's an infinite number of questions that could be asked but your teachers have focused you in on the types of questions that are, are to be asked. And these questions that I've got came from the Department of Public Instruction, which means they're the ones who wrote the test, so they're giving us questions that are very similar to the test. Okay, So that's why we're going to look at those. All right, let's start with a warm-up. This is a warm-up for all, everybody, regardless of your grade. Given this triangle with a side 3.862, and a side 217828 pi, find x. All right, I see those pencils going. I see them going. What are you doing? Are you setting up Pythagorean theorem? Nah, can't do that. There's no right angle there. Looks like a right angle, but it's not a right angle. Are you doing some trig? Nah, there's no angles in there to help you out. All right, I'll give you the answer. There it is. There's X. Get it? There's X. All right. You guys don't appreciate good math humor, I can tell. All right. <laughs> We're going to start with a little bit of, uh, I finished up a lot of the EOG, 7th, 6th, and 7th grade. I'm going to start with some of the algebra from the 8th grade EOG, which will lead into the algebra 1 for uh, the EOC, the end of course test. So these are good problems for everyone to pay attention to because there's some of that beginning algebra that you should know. As just a reminder, eighth grade. You can see this chart, and again, I'm going to zoom in just a little bit. Ooh, too much. Come back out. There we go. I just want to get enough on there. Note that the, one of the goals is your algebra goal. The learner will understand and use linear relations and functions. 
35 to 40 percent of the questions on the test are going to be around <coughs> algebra. If there was one thing that you studied tonight, it would be algebra, okay? I'm not saying that the rest of these aren't going to be on there. In fact, you'll, you can do fine with all of them, but almost 40 percent of the test potentially could be algebra, okay? So that's what you want to focus in on. If you have nothing, if you only have an hour to study tonight, if that was the one thing you studied, that would work. All right, well, let's get started. Remember, don't forget to call. All right, problem seven. Which is an equation of the line that passes through the points negative two, four, and five, three? All right, for you to find the equation of a line, they've given you four possibilities here. They've given you y equals negative seven x plus four, y equals seven x plus three, y equals one seventh x minus 26 sevenths, and y equals negative seven x plus 26 sevenths. The one thing you can do given two points, or actually just to find the equation of a line, you need two things. But one of the key elements that you need is slope. Because slope, we'll be able to put into the equation, where can I put it? Here, I'll put it right here. Y equals mx plus b. And do you notice how the m or the slope in all of these choices that they gave you are different? Which means if you find slope, you will find the equation that works. You won't even have to do any more work. So this, this problem doesn't involve finding the entire equation of the line. It simply involves really finding slope. Well, what is slope? In general, slope is rise over run. And what does that mean? That means it's looking up and down the y-axis. So you would take the change or the difference between the y-coordinates over the change or the difference of the x-coordinates, okay? If this was the coordinate system, you rise and run, you rise and run, you rise and run. And it would be that combination that will create a line on the coordinate system. All right, so, uh-oh. Can you, they can still see it a little bit. All right, we'll try to figure out what happened with that. All right, so, to find, there we go, I don't know. So the equation, must have been the power. So the equation for finding the slope, a lot of you have learned it like this, y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. And what that really means is the, the y coordinates take, subtract them, the second y coordinate minus the first y coordinate, the second x coordinate minus the first x coordinate. Come over here, here's our coordinates, negative two, four, and five, three. Go ahead and take a second and label them. This is x1, y1, x2, y2. Would it matter if you labeled this one with the x2s and y2s? No, just as long as you're consistent, okay? So let's go ahead and use slope to solve for this. And you know what? I use my finger to help me guide what I'm doing. So three minus four over five minus a minus two. I always write down the numbers, then I worry about doing the arithmetic. So what is three minus four? That would be negative one. What's five minus a minus two? Well, five minus a minus two would be five plus a positive two, which is seven. I caution you that if you are stuck in the slightest bit or you're not sure, on the EOC or the EOG, don't be proud. Just take a second and type it into your calculator. You're going to have it there as a tool for yourself. Sometimes you get nervous when you take in the test and you start mixing up your signs. I know you all can do that with arithmetic. I know that you can subtract integers, but sometimes you just get confused because you're nervous about the test. Just type it into your calculator and make sure you got the right answer if you have time. And you will. You'll be able to do this. All right, so if we look, finish this up, it worked out to be negative one-seventh. So if we come over here to our possible answers, slope was negative seven, nope. Slope is seven, nope. Slope is positive one seven, yeah, nope. Slope is negative one seven. So the answer would be D. Now where do you think these other choices came from? Well, the first choice comes from the fact, what if you had done the change in X over the change in Y? What would we have been left with? We would have left in seven over negative one, which is negative seven. So A, they're counting on you, uh, mixing up the formula, okay? So don't do that. On B, what are they counting on? Well, they're counting on you mixing up the formula and they're counting on the fact that you're going to mix up your integers. So when you did the three minus four, I'm sorry, the five minus a minus two over the three minus four, they're thinking that you're gonna come up with seven over one because you're gonna mess up your integers a little bit. Okay, so you don't wanna mix up the formula or make an error with your integers. And if C, what's Answer C with positive one seventh. They're looking to see that you made an error. Most likely the error would have come here. 
when you did 5 minus a minus 2, some people might have accidentally said negative 7 because you see all those negatives working there. So that's the error that they're looking, that that answer is looking for you to make. And you're not going to make that because you're going to check your work on the calculator. So we don't want that one. And of course, the answer is D. Right? So I know you can find the answer with slope, but I also want to show you some of these uh, problems on how they're trying to, I won't say trick you, but trying to, they're trying to trick you a little bit, okay? <laughs> All right, let's look at the next one. Number eight. Number eight is also algebra. Remember, that's all I'm focusing in on right now. Okay, there we go. A line has a slope of two-thirds and a y-intercept of negative four. Which of the following is an equation of the line? Well, there's a couple different ways you can handle this. Should they know opposite of A over B now? Okay. This is in standard form. All, every one of these equations is in standard form. So standard form is AX plus BY equals C. Now, if you wanted to, you could solve for Y and change it in the form Y equals MX plus B. All right? You can do that. However, that'll take a long time with all of these to do that. So what you want to do is you can find slope, which is equivalent to the m right here, by using these variables, or using the coefficients in front of the variables. Specifically, in standard form, if you take the opposite of a over b, you will get slope. All right, so let's look at a, or choice a. In this coefficient here is ax plus by equals c. So a is 2, so we'll say the opposite of 2 over negative 3 is positive 2 thirds. Is that a choice? That works, so that's a possibility. Let's look at the next one. The opposite of a over negative 3 is also 2 thirds. So b is a choice. Let's look at c. Opposite of a over uh, b is 3 halves, so now we've eliminated that c cannot be a choice. And same thing with d, the opposite of the a coefficient, negative 3 over negative 2 is positive 3 halves, so that eliminates d. So now our next question is, is what else do we need to do to figure out which one of these works? Well, there's another choice you can do. Now that we've narrowed it down to two of them, you can also find the y-intercept. The y-intercept is c over b, which is this coefficient c over the coefficient in front of the y. So what is 12 over negative 3? 12 over negative 3 would be negative 4. See the y-intercept is negative 4? Let's test the next one. Negative 4 over negative 3 is positive 4 thirds. So that one doesn't work anymore. All right, so now before, before you completely finish, let's go ahead and take the original and let's solve for y, because that is a choice that you could have made as well. If you can't remember these, which is just fine, then what you're going to have to do is solve each one of these for y. So to solve this equation, or any equation that's in standard form for y, the first thing you're going to do is subtract the x value from both sides. So we're going to subtract 2x. What are we left with? I need to tilt for a second. All right, so that leaves us with negative 3y equals negative 2x plus 12. Now what do we do? Well, now we're going to divide both sides, everything, by negative 3. That leaves us with y equals positive 2 thirds x. Uh, negative 3 divided into 12 would be negative 4. And now, of course, that matches up perfectly with the fact that we wanted the slope to be positive 2 thirds the y-intercept to be negative 4. All right, so there's two possible strategies for you. Go ahead and solve for y in each case and find the slope and the y-intercept. Or remember that in standard form, using the, the form ax plus by equals c, that you can find slope by taking the opposite of the a coefficient over b, and you can find the y-intercept by taking the c coefficient over b. All right. Excellent. Two possible strategies for you. Very good one. See, that slope is going to keep coming back, isn't it? All right, let's look at the next one. I might have to zoom out. All right, there we go. 
was going to see the data. Good. Which, equa the, which equation describes the data in the table below? Well, this table right here is really what? Well, it's, it's the reduction or increase in dietary fat can, together with the weight, or in the Y is the weight loss or gain in pounds. Okay, well, that's what they represent. But what if I turned it this way? Now, you don't have to turn it this way, but I want you to be able to see that this is nothing more than your XY chart. This is data. See the X? See the Y? Well, I've taken it off. But see the X and the Y? That simply represents your XY chart. So the question in this is, it is based on this, what is the equation of the line? So what did I tell you? There were two things that you needed to have to find the equation of a line. You needed to have slope and you needed to have y-intercept. So what you could do is go through and find the equation of this line, find the equation of the line, and then convert it to standard form, since that's what all of them are in. Okay. So that's one method. Let's go ahead and do that. So I'm just going to take these bottom two points, which are these points right up here. And what did I say we needed? We needed slope. So slope was that change in y over the change in x. So that's 7 minus a minus 1 over 5 minus 1. 7 minus a minus 1 is uh, 7 plus 1, which is 8. 5 minus 1 is 4, so slope is 2. Now we know slope, we need to find uh, the y-intercept, so we need a point and we need slope. So we can use point-slope form. Or for those of you who don't use point-slope form, you might want to solve for b. So well, let's, do, let's do point slope form. That's what you should know. And then I'm going to show you some other ways. So y minus the y-coordinate equals slope times x minus the x-coordinate. Ah, there we go. So y minus the y-coordinate. Well, which y-coordinate? Well, you know what? You've got one, two, three, four, five here to choose from. Mm, I'm going to choose negative one. Why? Because it's, it's one of the smaller numbers. Times slope. Slope we just found to be two times x minus the x-coordinate. We have to take the matching x-coordinate, so that would be 1. Now what do we need to do? We need to go ahead and get some more paper up here for us. There we go. We need to go ahead and simplify and solve. So y plus 1 equals 2x minus 2. Where would that come from? I distributed, right? Subtract 1 from both sides. We're left with y equals 2x minus 3. So there's our equation y equals 2x minus 3. All right, well, here's the problem. None of those match. So now we have to put this into standard form. So what is standard form again? Standard form is where you have your x's and y's on both sides. So it's in the form ax plus by equals c. The other thing you have to know is that a, b, and c are integers, meaning no fractions and decimals. That's a symbol for integers. And a has to be greater than or equal to 0, meaning a cannot be negative. So let's subtract 2x from both sides. We're left with negative 2x plus y equals negative 3. Divide everything by negative 1, because we have to make that positive. We're left with 2x minus y equals positive 3. Does that match one of them? 2x minus y, see if I can get it all in there equals 3. Well, sure enough, it matches D. So there's our answer. All right, well, that was a lot of work to get us there. And then things you'd have to remember, you have to remember how to find slope, which is fine. You have to remember point slope form because you needed slope and a point, which you can do. That's not a problem. Then you had to remember how to convert that back into standard form. All right, let's pretend on the test you get nervous and you, you're not quite sure what you need to do. Well, there's a very important fact, and I'm going to write it in big, bold print, and that is any, let's make sure I'm on the screen, any point on a line or graph, depending on what you're doing, so this is true for algebra and everyone else, on a graph is a solution to the equation. Any point on a line is a solution to the equation. So one of the other choices you could have done, if you got mixed up and you weren't sure what to do, 
is you could take all of these points, or at least pick one of them, and substitute it into these equations and see if they work. If the equation doesn't work, then that point is definitely not on that line, so it would help you eliminate things a lot faster. So let's go ahead and try that real quick, just so you can see. And this is, whoa, see that looked that nice. And I'm gonna go ahead and pick that point, the easiest point that I had on there, which was one, negative one. Let's see if that works on, in these. So that would be two times one plus negative one. Does that equal negative 27? Well, two times one is two, plus a negative one would be positive one. Does that equal negative 27? No, it does not. So A has been eliminated. See how fast that was? All right, how about the next one? One minus a minus one, does that equal three? One minus a minus one becomes one plus a positive one, which is two. Does two equal three? No, it does not. B, C has been eliminated. All right, how about the next one? One plus a negative one, does that equal negative 21? One plus negative one is zero, does zero equal negative 21? No, that's been eliminated. <laughs> Let's try the next one. Two times one minus a minus one, does that equal three? Two times one is two, minus a minus becomes plus one, does that equal three? Three does equal three, so once again the choice is D. And the only thing I'll caution you is what happens if two of those worked? Graphically, we know it, they're going to pass through the point one, negative one. Okay, so whatever the line is, and I, I know what the line is now, so I'm just going to put it here. But let's pretend that's the line. Is it possible for another point to pass, or another line to pass through that point? Sure is, right there. So what you'd need to do is if for some reason, let's say C and D worked, you could take another point over here in this list and substitute it in, and then you would narrow down. Let's pretend you substituted in the point five, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then sure enough, that would only be that would be the only line that works, and you'd be able to narrow down your choices. All right, so there's a way of doing kind of a guess and check without having to worry too much about your formulas. I'm sure you will remember them, but if you, oops, but if you don't, don't panic. There are ways to get things around. Get, there's ways to work around all of these problems. And the strategy that I used on that second part was any point on a line or a graph is a solution to the equation. Algebra, or sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, all the way through college grade, all of you, this is a true statement that you can't forget. It always helps out. All right. Whew. It's like if it takes me 20 minutes to do one problem, how am I ever going to get through the test? It won't, it's just taking me that long because I'm sitting here talking to you about some different strategies you can do. Let's look at number 10. And don't forget, you can go online and get a copy of these problems if you want to. And these, uh, the show will be put out, archived, and I'll find the website if we can find it. Is it the same website? Do we know? All right, I'll double check. But you can go out to, I believe, the East Wake television website, which I'll find the, the link for you, and you can go and look up Make the Grade, which is the name of the show, and you can do video on demand, and you can just see this show again where I've gone through these problems, okay? So if you don't have them in front of you or you haven't practiced yet, you can go back and look at this again. All right, let's look at problem 10. Ouch. <laughs> I just hit my head. All right, the perimeter of a rectangular swimming pool is, you can't see that at all, can you? All right, so note to self, I have to blow these up next year. So the perimeter of a rectangular swimming pool is 42 meters. The length is five meters more than the width. What is the length of the swimming pool? All right, there's a couple different ways we can approach this one. First of all, I'm going to draw it out. I need to visualize it. I'm a very visual person. So the perimeter of a rectangle, rectangular swimming pool is 42. So that means if I took this length plus this width plus this length plus this width, okay, perimeter equals 42 meters. Well, now we need to figure out what is the relationship between length and width. Width. And I always make a chart. You think I'm doing this for you? No, I'm doing this for me to help me get organized. It says the length is, length is <coughs> five meters more than the width. So let me ask you this. What if I told you the width was 10? What would the length be? Good, it would be 15. Why? Because the length is five meters more than the width. What if I told you the width was 
24. What would the length be? Good. It would be 29 because 24 plus 5. What if I told you width was W? Good. Length would be W plus 5. So now we have our length and our width. So everywhere I see L up here, I can replace it with W plus 5. W plus 5. Now why would I want to do that? Well, if we added up all these values the first time, I had W plus L plus W plus L, or 2W plus 2L equals perimeter, correct? Well, that's two variables, so it's much more helpful for to us. <laughs> Try that again. It's much more helpful for us if we have just one variable. Well, now what do we know L equals? L equals W plus 5. It's the width plus 5. So now we can say 2w plus 2 times w plus 5, just do a direct substitution, will equal the perimeter. Well, what is the perimeter? Well, they told us that the perimeter is 42 meters. So 42. That is an equation you can solve. Let's do it. So 2w plus, what do we have to do here? We have to distribute 2w plus 10 equals 42. Combine similar terms and solve for w. We're left with 4w plus 10 equals 42. Subtract 10 from both sides. I'm just going to come up here. We're left with 4w equals 32. Divide by 4 on both sides. We're left with w equals 8. w equals 8. So go back up to our table. w equals 8. And the length then, if the w equals 8, the length would be 13. And now let's be sure we're answering the question because, see how I just came up with two numbers? I came up with 8 and 13. What if I had stopped at 8? <gasps> Look at that. I would have been so happy. Why would I have been so happy? Because A is 8. And I would have seen that, circled 8, and be done. No. Look at this. The question says, what is the length of the swimming pool? You know what I call this? I call this a lollipop question. Lollipop, lollipop, oh, lollipop, lollipop. Okay? It's a sucker question because the, you're going to be so happy that you did all this work and came up with an answer that when it appears on the list of choices, you're going to start bubbling. So before you start bubbling, I need you to read the question again. Remember I said, and I know I've soapboxed about this a couple times, read the question once, once to get an idea what the question's about, read it twice to pick out your numbers, and the third time read it so you can really figure out what the question they're asking you is. All right, 10.5 meters. Where's that coming from? Well, I'm not sure. We'd have to rework it to find out. But look at this, 13 meters. That's what we want. We wanted the length. So they have a trick answer in here, and they're always going to have a trick answer, and there's somewhere along the way for you. Now, where did this other one come from? 16 months? I'm not even sure where that might have come from. I bet if we'd done the wrong form. You know what? I bet part of it came from, no? You know what I'm surprised they don't have here is 8 times 13 or 7 times 2. I'm surprised I didn't try to trick you with some area formulas, but anyway, just watch your answers, okay? Let me back out just a little bit so you can see everything I did. All right, so what did I do? I drew a picture to visualize the problem. I wrote down the formula that I know, which is 2w, or, you know, width plus length, width plus length, which is 2 width plus 2 length equals the perimeter. I div figured out what width and length were in relationship to one variable, width, Sub made a substitution, solved for my width, was careful to go back and read the question to see what they were looking for. They're looking for length, I, and I used a table to help me get it organized. All right, and you're going to do the same thing, and you're going to do great and get the answer. Okay, did we get a call? All right, so we'll tackle that geometry EOC here in a second. All right, let's do, I think we've got one final problem or two final problems for some of this algebra. And this is good. This is good for all of you, even geometry, because you know what, geometry? You're expected to remember all the algebra that you have done up to this point. Now, I'm sure you do remember, but you have to remember things like your midpoint formula and your distance formula and all these other little formulas and slope and writing equations of lines that you might not have done in geometry because it's expected that you knew it. So this is good review for you as well. All right. A spring... I'll get these retyped next time, okay? Let me dry it. Because you won't be here. Someone will be here. A spring stretches linearly. That's a tough word for me to say. 
as weight is added. The table below shows data collection for a certain type of spring. All right, so can you envision that, that we've got a spring, and as you add weight to it, keep stretching out, kind of like a slinky, if you would you take a slinky and stretch it. All right, so let's look at some of our choices. It says, let's get this on again, da, 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 go, go. All right, so it says if it's a 100 pound weight, it stretches 0. 0.5 centimeters, 500, 2.5, 800, 4.0, 900, 4.5, and 1200, 6.0. You all, what is that representing? Well, you see how they have a little X here, a little Y here? This is nothing more than your XY chart. And the question is asking, what is the slope of the line that fits this data? So they're simply saying, okay, you've got five X's, oops, sorry. You've got five X's and five Y's, which represent what? Coordinates, your X, Y chart. Let's go ahead and find slope. So pick any two of them. Now, your teachers might have told you to just grab the bottom two. Some of you might take the top two. Some of you might say pick a random two. Last time I picked the bottom two, this time I'm gonna pick the top two. And you know the only reason I would do that? is because the numbers are smaller, but you can pick any two points you want. So I'm gonna choose the point 100.5 or half and 500, 2.5. And let's go ahead and find the slope. Whoa, there we go. So what is slope again? Slope is the change in y's over the change in x or the difference. So let's do that. So 2.5 minus 0.5 divided by 100, oh, I'm sorry, stayed in the same order, 500 minus 100. 2.5 minus 0.5 would leave us with 2. 500 minus 400 would leave, uh, <laughs> minus 100 would leave us with 400. Uh, 2 goes into both of those, so 1 two hundredth. Whoops, 1 two hundredth. Let's look at our choices here. Ah, oh, look at A, grasshopper. 1 two hundredth. All right, so even though this, looked like it could have been a complicated problem. It was really just data, which is really in the form of an XY chart. Pick any two points and find slope. Find slope, this seems to be a reoccurring theme. Find slope, find slope. You know what, not going away, not going away. <laughs> All right, well let's go ahead and take a second and uh, if you have any other questions on the, uh, any questions from your EOG from sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, please just give me a call and I'll go ahead and do that. I'd like to go ahead and talk a little bit about the EOCs. Now, first thing I'm gonna talk about, and I'll bring in a, a list of some more formulas, and they're already posted out there for you, but let's look at this chart real quick. And I'll bring in some more demo, or more information about this. In algebra, or this is the uh, take two. There are some formulas that you're gonna need to know, some geometry formulas that you're gonna need to know in both algebra one, geometry, and algebra two. Okay, they might not be formulas that you learned this year, they might be formulas that you have, were supposed to come in with. Some of them are things that you learned. What's new to Algebra 1 is finding the lengths and midpoints of segments to solve problems. Can you read that? That's one of the formulas that used to be in geometry and now it's in Algebra 1. What is that? Finding lengths. Well, that's the distance formula. And finding midpoints. That's the midpoint formula, okay? Then in geometry, oh, geometry, you're gonna need to know the ones that came from Algebra Plus, be sure that you know your trig ratios. Be sure that you know the surface area and volume of a sphere, a cone, and a pyramid. Now, these are ones that you may not have known. That's not to say you're not supposed to know the ones like the, the surface area and volume of a rectangular prism or a, uh, not a cone, a cylinder, thank you. <laughs> Okay, some of your other shapes that you, you should know, you should have known that coming into geometry. So all those formulas that they taught you this year, you still, you need to take those into the test with you. Plus all the formulas from midpoint and segment. And even though they're not listed here, things like the, look at me, some things like the uh, area of a square, the area of a triangle, area of a circle, circumference of a circle, all of those formulas that you learned at some point before you actually got into geometry, those have trickled down and are now something that should always be there. So what I'm talking about are new formulas that were not, not taught or may not have been taught earlier on. Okay, so you still have to know all of them, plus you have to know these. And then in Algebra 2, if we look back at this chart, it says no additional geometry formulas. That simply means that you need to know what came from Algebra 1, which came, which came into geometry. And then of course, we have ones from elementary school 
plus middle school, or if you're in middle school now taking uh, Algebra 1, any formula you learned up until this point is going to trickle down into all of these other classes, okay? So math is very cumulative. You have to keep remembering and learning. Now next time what I'll do, oh, here we go. Note that students' knowledge and understanding of relationships, you can't really see that, so I'm reading it, at each grade level is expected to carry forward. This includes material from grades 8 and lower as given on the 2003 EOG formula sheet. This is at the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction website. And I'll see you again. I need to see if I can look that up for you. But if you do a search on NCDPI, North, North, Carolina, North Carolina Department of Public Instruction, do a search on that, I bet you'll find it, okay? And it'll get, leave you the list of all the formulas you should know. All right, so we've been doing some algebra. Let's go ahead and do some geometry. That'll take care of my caller, I hope. All right, let's look at this first one. Geometry, geometry. Ow, I keep doing that. <laughs> a right triangle is shown below. What is the approximate value of x? Okay, can you see that? Pretty good. All right, what is the approximate value of x? So looking at this first thing, it's good that they sh told us, or at least they marked that it was a right triangle. You can't do much with this problem unless they've told you that. So looking at this, they've given us two sides, and they've given, they're telling us to look for this angle. Whenever you have two sides and, and you're looking for an angle, or you have uh, a, an angle in one side, you have basically two parts out of the three that you're looking for, this is telling you that you most likely need to use your trig ratios. And what were those trig ratios? Well, if you recall, um, I bet all of your teachers taught you something like S O H C, oops, A H T O A for the great Sakatoa. Okay? And what did this stand for? This represented that the sine of an angle is equal to the opposite over hypotenuse. This told you that the cosine of an angle is equal to the adjacent side over the hypotenuse. Trig ratios were nothing more than that, just ratios. And the tangent of an angle is equal to the uh, sorry, opposite over adjacent, just that ratio. All right, so looking at this one, based off the angle, and I strongly recommend this to all of you, circle the angle you're dealing with and identify the parts. This part is the opposite, and the 30 is the hypotenuse. Okay. Which ratio uses opposite and hypotenuse? Hmm. Sine. So the sine of an angle equals the opposite over hypotenuse. Let's substitute in what we know. The sine of what angle? Well, the angle is x. So the sine of x equals its opposite, 8 over 30, the hypotenuse. All right, so now what do we do? Well, you could start typing into your calculator and try to figure it out, but something else important that you need to know, aside from the fact that the sine of an angle is the opposite over hypotenuse, you need to remember the reverse of that. And that is that the inverse sine of a ratio is equal to its angle. The inverse cosine of a ratio is equal to the angle. The inverse, whoa, I have no idea what letter that was supposed to be. Okay, the inverse tangent of a ratio is equal to the angle. And this is the case that we have. We're looking for an angle, so we need to reverse our thinking and reverse our mathematics to find the angle. And you guys, that's no different than what you normally do. If it was, you know, 3x equals 15, you would divide both sides by 3 because it's the opposite operation, correct? All right, so we convert this to be the inverse sign of the ratio, well, the ratio is 8 30. Let's let the calculator take care of that. Equals our angle x. All right, so we need to pop over the calculator. Now, before we go look at the screen of the calculator, I need you to look at the actual calculator. I need that. I don't know what I did with my overhead. See, I feel like I'm just not ready for you today. I have an overhead of the actual calculator, but for right now, let's just poke in on this. Woo! Now you can see it good. All right. Can you? There's something that will make it focus itself. Auto focus. There it goes. All right. So see right here the sine button? Above the sine button it says sine negative 1. Cosine button, cosine negative 1. Tangent button, tangent negative 1. All right. Now the very, oops, let me go back out. This is what you're going to see the day of the EOG. Your calculator will be in front of you. And the teachers are going to come around and they're going to say, 
I now need to clear the memory. Okay? And they're going to come in and they're going to do second plus sign. Don't worry about what's on the screen right now. Oh, we're going to turn it on first. Hello. I'm going to do second plus sign and it's going to say, do you want to reset your memory? Yes, seven. And yours might be five depending on which version you have. I want to reset everything. One, are you sure you want to reset? Yes, reset. Okay, now you're ready to go. Now you can start your EOG. Go. All right. And the very first thing, this was question one. And the question one, you're going to get in here and you're going to say, okay, now I need to do the inverse sine of 8 thirtieths. So now you can look at my calculator screen. It's on, it's blinking, it's ready. So I'm going to do the inverse sine of 8 thirtieths, enter. 0.269932. So that's telling me that that angle, if I go back over to my screen, that x is about 0.2699. Uh oh. None of my answers matched that, did they? No, my answers were something like 14.9, 15.5, 74.5, 75.1. I'm actually very surprised that they didn't have the choice 26.99 on there, thinking that you needed to do it, or some combination of these numbers. All right, so what happened? We'll go back to the calculator a second. If there's anything you needed to do, actually look at me. When you go to take a test, okay, especially these, these end of year tests, which are, there's a lot of pressure put on them for you to perform well and do well on them, which you will, okay? Or let's pretend you're getting ready for a game, or let's pretend you're getting ready to, you know, put on, uh, it's a concert and you're gonna, you have a solo. Any of these things that you're getting ready to do, what, it, what is it you do to get ready for these games? All right, you get dressed out, you stretch a little, but don't you kind of, in your mind, put yourself in the right frame of mind the right mode for getting to the game or taking the game, or the right mode for doing your concert, or the right mode for taking the test. Okay, you hear me saying that? I need you, when you get your geometry test, put yourself in the right mode for the test. The right mode for the test. And I know this is a silly visual, but that's what I want you to see. The reason why is now look back at my calculator. If I hit mode, now your calculator might look slightly different just because of the version, but it, it's going to have this. The third one down, see, uh, third one down says radian. How many of you know what a radian is? All right, I see a handful of you raising your hand, okay? That's not everybody. In fact, in geometry, unless it was an extension, did you really learn about radians? No, you're gonna learn about radians most likely in later algebra two and definitely algebra three or pre-calculus, but you do know what degrees are. The default when they, when they, when your teacher comes around to uh, clear your memory, the default is radians, which is why we got an answer like 2.69932. So what you need to do, oh, 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 put yourself in the right mode for the test. Go down to radian, over to degree, and hit enter. See how degree is blinking, 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 blinking. All right, you got it? You're gonna put yourself in the degree mode for the test. So now if I come back over here and I put in the same problem and hit enter, oh, now look, inverse sine is approximately 15.466. So let's write that one down. So x is approximately 15.4, we'll just round 47. Based on that, is that one of our possible choices? Well, here we have 15.5. So yes, it is one of our choices. Now, where did these other numbers come from? These other numbers, specifically, let's see, 90 minus 15.5 is 74.5. So if you got 74.5, you accidentally did uh, cosine. You did the wrong function. So always take note of what values are there. If you got 14.9, you just did some rounding wrong. Okay, all right. So you're going to remember that. And what are you going to remember to do? Home, home, home. Put yourself in the right frame of mode for the test. You guys, that's true for everybody. Algebra 1, geometry, algebra 2, chemistry. Anybody who has to clear that calculator, be sure you're in the right mode for the test. All right, I know it's goofy, but all right, let's look at another one. <gasps> let's see what this one's about. It's a tree. As soon as I see a tree, you know what's going through my mind? Trig. You know why? Because whenever they have a tree, a tree, whenever they have a tree, or they have a ladder, or a building, or 
It could be anything. A person standing there flying a kite. You know, what's the height of the kite to the ground? All of these are, are going to make, most of the time, these are going to make right triangles. In fact, that's what you want to look for, is the right triangle. So let's see. I haven't read the problem yet. I'm just guessing. Just guess, because it's a tree. And they always like to use trees and flagpoles for trig problems. And boats. And, and lighthouses. It's just one of those things. All right, so let's see. A dead tree oh, was struck by lightning, causing it to fall over at a point 10 feet up from the base of the tree. If the fallen treetop, <coughs> let me go a little closer here, sorry. If the fallen treetop forms a 40 degree angle with the ground, about how tall was the tree originally? All right, so what are they doing? You see right here, see this triangle right here? Maybe you can, maybe you can't, but you know what? You know what you can do? You know what you can do? I'll tell you. You could rewrite it. So that represents the triangle that is the tree. So we can just pull it out to see a little bit better. If the fallen tree top forms a 40 degree angle with the ground, about how tall was the original tree? Well, how would we find the height of the original tree? Well, you'd have to take the tree and stand it up, wouldn't you? Well, trust me, that's the tree stood up. Maybe it was good that it fell over, my version. So basically, you'd stand the tree up to see how tall it was. So what is this length? Well, this length is this piece right here. Just take it and stand it up. So what are we looking for? We're looking for this tipped over length right here. So this is what we're looking for, x. So if we can find how, how much fell over, then we can stand it up, and we can find out the height of the whole tree. What other information did they give us? They told us that a tree was struck by lightning, causing it to fall over at a point 10 feet up from the base of the tree. So from here to the break is 10 feet. Let's put that in our triangle. Now, you don't have to rewrite it. But I don't know about you, but seeing this picture right here is a little more confusing than just seeing a basic triangle. All right, so if we look at this basic triangle, the question was how, about how tall was the tree originally, which means we need to find the value of x before we can do anything else. So I've been given two parts and an angle, so what is that telling me? Well, depending on the angle, because sometimes if it's a 45, 40, 45, 45, 90, and this, oh, trees are always perpendicular to the ground, flagpoles are always perpendicular to the ground, buildings, kites, whatever they happen to be, everything's always perpendicular to the ground. No, I know that's not true, but that's what we pretend all the time when we do trig. So if it happened to be a special angle, like 30, 60, 90, or 45, 45, 90, you could probably do a shortcut if you wanted to. But you can always do trig, even if you forget your shortcuts. All right, so what do we do? We have an angle. Identify the parts. We have the opposite. We have the hypotenuse. And what was the opposite and hypotenuse uh, relationship? Well, remember Sakatoa? S-O-H, C-A-H, woo, let's go out a little bit, Sakatoa, right, the famous Indian. Another one a friend of mine taught me was Oscar had a heap of apples. And you just have to remember that sine, cosine, tangent, that's the order, okay? Oscar had a heap of apples. All right, so which one uses opposite and hypotenuse? That would be the sine. So specifically what? Well, the sine of an angle equals the opposite over hypotenuse. Let's put in our details now. The sine of the angle, 40, equals the opposite, 10, over the hypotenuse, x. How would we solve that? You can cross multiply and solve, or one of the things you're allowed to do in any proportion is either switch your means or switch your extremes. As long as the cross product always works, you can do that. So I can rewrite this to be x over 1 equals 10 over the sine of 40. Let your calculator handle that multiplication. So let's come over here. So 10 divided by the sine of 40 degrees, get in the habit of closing your parentheses, please, is about 15.6. Okay. So it's about 15.6. So if we look on our choices over here, we have 13 feet, we have 16. Oh, wow, if we round up, it must be B, 16, right? Because it was 15.6. We can round up to 16. Whew. Next problem. No, no, no. What do I say? When you have a problem, we're going to read it for context. It was a tree. It fell over. Then what are we going to do? We're going to read it for the numbers. We need to go back and read it to see what they wanted you to answer. I guarantee in geometry, you're so used to doing the algebra that when you find the algebraic answer at the end of the problem, you're just going to be so happy. You're going to start bubbling because something matched. No. 
go back and see if that's what they wanted you to look at. So let's look at the problem again. The problem says, about how tall was the original tree? Well, what you just found was the length of where the break was. You just found this to be 15.6, this length. To find out how tall the tree was originally, we have to stand it up, right? Oops. And we get 15.6. So now how tall was the original tree? Well, 15.6 plus 10 gives us 25.6, which is about, well, that wasn't about anyway, but based on our answers over here, 26, whoop, 26 feet. And sure enough, our choices over here is D, 26 feet. That's a sucker question right there. They're gonna, you're going to be so happy you found the algebra answer that you're not going to finish the problem. Please, please, please finish the problem. Because geometry is, geometry is the application of algebra. So they're going to have the final algebraic answer there. Okay? Sometimes that's what you want. Sometimes, no, that's not what you want. Okay? All right, good job. All right, let's see what else. Number three, what is the area of the trapezoid? All right, area of a trapezoid. You need to know how to find area of a trapezoid, first of all. So area of a trapezoid, well, if you recall, a trapezoid is very similar to a triangle. So the area of a triangle is 1 half base times height. You've known that for a long time. Well, a trapezoid is really nothing more than a kind of a triangle that got its top chopped off, right? So what's different about it? Well, it has two bases now. So the area of a trapezoid is equal to 1 half the height times the sum of the two bases. Okay, very similar. In fact, almost anything you can do with a triangle, you can do with a trapezoid. Write down your recipe first. Write down the recipe that you're going to be using and looking for. And then what I strongly recommend is that you write down all the variables that you need to have. Write down the variables that you need. And then this is kind of like you've got a recipe. This is what you need. Now walk over to the pantry and see what you've got. One of our bases is 12, so I can put 12 here. Done. Height, I don't know how, height. Is height 8? No, height is not 8 because height should always be what? Drop as if you were standing on the top of this uh, trapezoid and dropped a string straight down to make a right angle. That would be height. All right. So height is always perpendicular. So this is not the height. This is just a leg. And base 2, we don't know base 2 is right now, so that's all the information. So we have to find a little bit more. All right, so looking at this, it, said, it doesn't say it was isosceles, but see how little tick marks here and marking it are isosceles? So that means that the legs are congruent, they mark the legs congruent, and these base angles are all congruent. But let's just focus in over here. This is 8. Okay, so I'm going to take this little piece right here, this little part of the triangle, and let's just enlarge it for your viewing pleasure. This is what I have. I have a 60-degree angle, I have an 8 there, and I'm looking for H. Where have we seen that pattern before? We've seen that pattern. Well, you guys, this is a 30, 60, 90 triangle. 30, 60, 90. And if it's a 30, 60, 90, then we know that the short leg is half the length of the hypotenuse. And isn't 8 the hypotenuse? Sure is. So that little piece is 4. And then what is the height? The height is the short leg times radical 3. Now, if you couldn't remember that, it's okay. You could do some trig if you wanted to. You would have had the angle 60, and you were looking for the opposite and had the hypotenuse. You could do sine. So you can still use trig. If nothing else, learn your trig ratios, and you can do that. Or if you can remember that the short leg is half the hypotenuse, then you have two values. You could do Pythagorean theorem to find the third. All right, so what did we just find? We just found height, 4 radical 3. So now we need to find base 2. So let's go back to our original picture. So in our original picture, what, whoo, what did we just find? What did we just find? I'm having a hard time with uh, all my verbs today, aren't I? We just find, found that that little piece right there is 4. What if I took and cut for this little piece and made a rectangle? This little piece would be 4 because it's the same triangle. And see how I made a rectangle? Aren't these opposite sides congruent? So that would be 12. So what is base 2? Base 2 would be the sum of all of these values. Segment addition postulate, right? So 4 plus 12 plus 4 should give us There's the last piece that we needed. So we have all our ingredients. We have the recipe. Let's go ahead and figure out what the area of a trapezoid is. Let's do it. So the area of the trapezoid was equal to 1 half the height. Height is what? 4 radical 3 
times the sum of the bases, 12 plus 20. Simplify and solve, 1 half, 4 radical 3 times 32. 1 half times 4 radical 3, or 1 half times 32, I think that's easier to do the whole number, would be 16 times 4 radical 3. Now when you do radicals, remember the rule is outsides times outsides, insides times insides. So it would be 16 times 4, which is 64 square roots of 3. This right here is an exact, exact answer. It has a radical. That's okay. That's perfectly legal. That is an exact answer. Let's look at the answer choices they gave us. The answer choices they gave us were numbers like 83.1, 110.9, et cetera. These are decimal values. These are not exact answers necessarily. So what that means is we need to take the answer we got over here, 64 radical 3, and find the approximation. And to find the approximation, we would just type that into the calculator. So let's see. 64 times radical 3, enter, is about 110.9. Eight five. There we go. So 110.85, does that match one of our choices? Well, 110.9, if we took the same number and rounded it to the nearest tenth, then it works. So our answer choice is B. Okay. So this was a two-fold problem. Not only did you have to know area of a trapezoid, but you also had to be careful not to get tricked that that 8 was not the height. It's slanted. Height is always standing straight up. When you go to the doctor and they measure to see how tall they are, what do they tell you to do? Put your heels to the back of the wall, please. I want you to stand up nice and straight. That's height, standing up straight, not slanting over, okay? So we had to find height using a 30, 60, 90 triangle, or you could have used trig. We found all our values, and then we cut up the trapezoid into a rectangle in two little pieces to get the whole second base, then used our formula and solved. All right? Excellent day. Geometry. We got a call. Still geometry? Out. Till you're making me jump all around. All right. I guess I can do it. All right. Let's look at this now. Again, these questions are coming from the Algebra Two EOC, which are all posted online at not only DPI, but they are posted online at Wake County's website. The equation. Oops. Sorry. The equation H equals. The equation, h equals 241m to the negative one-fourth, predicts a mammal's heart rate in beats per minute based on its mass, m, in kilograms. What is the predicted heart rate in beats per minute of a polar bear with a mass of 326 kilograms? So the heart rate of a bear, right, let's, let me pick up my zip. So the equation was H equals 241 times the mass to the negative one-fourth. Predicts a mammal's heart rate based on its mass M. What is the predicted heart rate of a polar bear with a mass? So its heart rate, H, equals 241 times its mass, which is 300, or, yeah, 326, raised to the negative one-fourth power. I do not expect you to do this by hand. Get your calculator. Let's see. So 241 times 326, that number raised, let's use the caret, and put this in parentheses so it doesn't uh, mess up, negative one-fourth, enter. H is approximately 56.7. So which one of those works? Well, they have the answers in whole numbers, so this would have uh, become 57. So the answer choice is A. So don't get, uh, don't worry, I'm, I'm, I wager the reason you were nervous about this one is because, oh, is this an equation I'm supposed to know? No, you're not supposed to know the equation of a, the heart rate of a mammal. I mean, you might know it if, uh, I don't know, you're a biologist, okay? It might be something that you learn. But what you really need to do is they've given you a formula. And don't be surprised if you see this throughout the test, that they give you a formula. It might give you you know, how they find wind chill factor. They might give you just some random formula that you're not familiar with. I think there was one that we had uh, last week that was talking about the, the distance to the sun, and it was a unit that people aren't used to hearing, okay? It's okay. Just look at the problem for its context. You had an equation. They gave you a variable. They substituted one of the variable pieces. 
put it in, type it into your calculator and solve it. I'm sure you could have done that by hand. You might have been able to. Don't panic. Just let your calculator do the work. All right? All right. Well, I think I'm out of time. So thank you for calling. Get these EOC questions. They're out there on the web. Or ask your teacher about them. Or like I said, if you're not sure, email me. And if you recall, the email address for me before they cut me off. I lost it. Here, I'll write it again real quick. Is math. Let me zoom out. There we go. Is math help two H's at WCPSS.net. And if you can't find the questions or you're stuck on one or you're not quite sure what to do, just email me and I will tell you how to do it or give you some clues. Otherwise, I will see you on Tuesday, Wednesday, and thirty Thursday between 4 and 5 just to review. Review, review, review. Call me about any question. All right, you guys, I'll see you next week. Thanks. Bye-bye.